Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Parsha. As I'm sure you recall, we are currently in the middle of reading the third book of Chumash, the book of Va Vayikra. Vayikra means he called. And for the whole book of Vayikra, it's called that because, oh, hang on. Hello? Hello, who is it? It's Hashem calling. Hashem, who are you calling for? Hashem is calling for Moshe. Hashem, I will pass the phone over right away. I know I'm being silly. Hashem isn't really using the phone. But for the whole book of Vayikra, Hashem is calling Moshe to give instructions about the Mishkan that we just finished building at the end of the book of Shemot. Now, this week, we actually have a double Parsha because we have more Parshas than weeks in the year. And we need to get through the whole Torah in one year. So some weeks, like this week, we squish two Parshas together to make a double Parsha. So this week, we read Behar and Bechukotai. And we squish them together to make Behar Bechukotai. Now, Behar means at the mountain. What mountain is it talking about? Mount Sinai, Har Sinai. Uh, the Parsha is called that because it starts off by telling us that this entire Parsha takes place at Har Sinai. This is all things that Hashem says to Moshe at Har Sinai. What does it say Hashem says to Moshe at Har Sinai? It starts off by saying every seven years is called Shemitah. The seventh year is the Shemitah year. What does that mean? Well, just like every seven days we have Shabbat and we have our day of rest, uh, every seven years is Shemitah, and that's a year of rest for the land. Our land works very hard for us. We plant seeds. It turns the seeds. We're using soil and water and sunlight. It turns the seeds into food for us, into, into vegetables and fruit and trees and flowers and wheat and all kinds of things that we need for our purposes. The land works very hard. The land deserves a rest. So every seven years, the land gets its year of rest for Shemitah. We don't plant. We don't garden. We don't cultivate the land. We don't harvest. Uh, we've got enough to eat from food that we saved from the previous year, and we can eat what grows on its own for what we need right away. You want an apple, you can pick an apple and eat it. You can't go apple picking and get a whole bag of them to take home for later. And then the Torah tells us that every seven Shemitah years, so seven times seven years, which is 49, in the 50th year, we have the Yovel year. What is Yovel? We're going to start it off by blowing a big shofar. Now in Yovel, uh, like Shemitah, again, the land gets an extra year of rest. We don't plant, we don't garden, we don't harvest. Another cool thing that happens in the, in the Yovel year is the land all returns to its original owners. You know, people own land. When we enter the land of Israel, Shem divides up the land to give each person their own piece of land. Uh, we, we might buy and sell land. If I buy a field from you, then in the Yovel year, I have to give it back to you. If you buy a field from me in the Yovel year, it becomes mine again, with a few exceptions. Ex exception number one, the laws of the Torah, for the most part, only apply to Jewish people. So if I sell my land to somebody who's not Jewish, they're not obligated in Yovel. They're not obligated to give me my land back in the 50th year, but I'm still obligated to get that land back. So if I sell my land to somebody who's not Jewish, then by the Yovel year, I have to buy it back. I have to pay them a fair price and buy the land back so that it, come, it comes back to me in the Yovel year. And if I don't have enough money to buy the land back, then it becomes the responsibility of everybody in my family to buy the land back so that it can, it can come back to my own family. Uh, and the Torah reminds us at this point in time also not to char charge unfair interest to our fellow Jews. Of course, when you get interest, you know, if you lend somebody money, if they pay it back a little late, they give a little extra as like a thank you for letting me use your money for longer, just like the bank pays its interest. Gives it, if you keep our money in the bank, a the bank adds a little bit to it as a thank you for letting us hold on to your money. Uh, but the Torah says if you're lending to a fellow Jewish person, you know, be thoughtful, be generous, uh, consider this person as a part of your family. So you don't want to charge too much interest and make their life difficult. The third thing that happens in the Yovel year is back in Torah times, uh, sometimes the people who didn't have the money to support themselves they would make themselves a servant. They would work for somebody else, live in that person's house and work for them. And that way they didn't have to worry about having the money for a home and food for themselves. But in the Yovel year, anyone who's working for somebody else, that's when they go free, they go home and they become their own boss again. Uh, and the Torah says, you know, if your fellow Jewish person is living in your house and working for you, you must treat them well, treat them kindly, treat them like a member of your own family because they're living with you and they're working with you. 
Don't ask them to do something you wouldn't do yourself. Uh, and again, we've got our what if somebody ends up working in the home of someone who isn't Jewish, who isn't obligated in Yovel, then it is the responsibility of this person's family and by extension, the responsibility of every single Jewish person to buy them back so that they can go home and be their own boss by the Yovel year. It is our responsibility to make sure that every Jewish person can have a home to go to and be their own boss in their own home. That is where we uh, finish Parshat Behar. We continue with Bechu Kotai. Bechu Kotai means in my rules. And it is called that because the Parsha starts off with Hashem saying, if you follow Bechu Kotai, if you follow in my rules, then everything will be wonderful. The Parsha tells us all these amazing rewards we'll get if we follow the Torah and follow Hashem and make good choices. We'll get rain when we need rain and lots and lots of delicious food will grow. We'll have enough, more than enough food. There will be no wild animals to bother us. There will be no war if we're in any fights. We'll win them easily. But... If we do not follow Bechu Kotai, if we do not follow in Hashem's rules, if we abandon Hashem and abandon the Torah and willfully make bad choices, then the Parsha tells us all sorts of horrible things will happen. We will have illness. We will lose our fights to our enemies. We will have no food to grow. We will be hungry. We will be ravaged by wild animals. There will be war and destruction if we do not. Remember, we learned about Shemitah at the beginning of this Parsha. If we do not let the land have its year of rest in the Shemitah year, the land will take its rest from us by kicking us out. We will be exiled. The land will lie empty for it to make up however many years of rest we try to cheat it of. But Hashem says, even if we make bad choices, even if we abandon Hashem and abandon the Torah and don't let the land have its rest, even if we get punished, even if we get kicked out of our land, Hashem will never forget us. Hashem will never stop loving us. And after we have had our consequences, after the land has made up its years of rest, Hashem will bring us back into our home, into our land of Israel, and will help us be settled and safe and comfortable and happy there. And Hashem will take care of us. And the Parsha ends with rules about when we make promises of gifts to Hashem, to the Mishkan. Talks about how much exactly we have to pay or give depending on what we promise. Uh, and if you promise an animal to the Mishkan, there's no takebacks or no tradesies. Uh, you give the exact animal that you promise with no substitutes. Uh, and that's if it's a kosher animal. If it's non-kosher animal, what's, what's the Mishkan going to do with a non-kosher animal? Instead, the Kohen will find out for you how much it costs, and that's how much money you give to the Mishkan. If you promise if you give promise land to the Mishkan, then that land belongs to the Mishkan. You get one year to buy it back. If you want to buy it back, you have to pay an extra one-fifth of the price. And if you don't buy it back within that year, then there's one more exception for the Yovel rule for land going back to its original owners. Uh, because if you don't buy your land back after one year, if you sell it to the if you give it to the Mishkan, it belongs to Hashem forever. It belongs to the Mishkan. You don't get it back even in Yovel. And of course, we were reminded you can't promise something to Hashem that already belongs to Hashem. So for example, you can't say, hey, Hashem, I promise I'll give this firstborn animal because firstborn animals already belong to Hashem automatically. It's like you wouldn't walk into somebody's house and pick up their, their possessions and stick it in a gift bag and say, here, I brought you a present. You don't give somebody something that's already theirs. That is where we finish Parshat Behar Bechukotai. And it is also where we finish the entire book of Vayikra. And there's something we say when we finish reading a book of the Torah. We say, Chazak, Chazak, Venit Chazak, which means strong, strong. We will make ourselves strong because learning Torah makes us stronger. We've made ourselves so strong from learning now three books of Torah since we started this cycle. And we're going to make ourselves even stronger by learning even more Torah next week, starting with the fourth book of Chumash. So let's all say together, Chazak, Chazak, Benit Chazak. Shabbat Shalom.